You're watching Capital Connection from the Illinois State Capitol. Former House Speaker Michael Madigan pleaded not guilty in federal court this week, arriving on telephone, his lawyer doing most of the talking for him. That court process set to play out his next status hearing set for April 1st. Joining us now is one of the 19 House Democrats who voted to remove Madigan as speaker and install a new speaker, Chris Welch. Maurice West, a House Democrat from Rockford, good to have you with us. Glad to be here. How do you view those events now, these 13 months, 14 months later? You know, when it first came out, I had mixed emotions. I felt vindicated. I just, I felt the mad. Indictment. Yeah, the indictment. I felt vindicated. I felt mad just be based on everything that we went through during that process. But um, I, I told people in my district, let the process play out. He's still innocent to proven guilty. However, the decision I made back in October of 2020 coming out and saying I'm not going to vote for him was the right decision then. And of course, now you see that it's the right decision now. You say October and that was early on enough that it really kind of, I think it was interesting because Madigan really put his cards in the Black Caucus staying behind his back and I think you were one of the first to show some shifting ground beneath his feet. Mm -hmm. it, I, wanted, I wanted to do it before the election because if I waited till after, it doesn't have the same weight on whether or not I'm doing it for the right reasons. So I did it before the election because I needed my constituents to know that this is the right decision no matter what my, it does to my political career. Are, are House Democrats, it, it's just so interesting to watch this because I think some are still pretty sensitive to what all happened. I mean, there are some who are testifying before grand juries even now about that, that sprawling investigation. Do you, do you think you've fully purged that era of corruption or is there still some lingering shadow or cloud? That I don't know. Um, if we purge the era of corruption, because you're right, there's still some sensitivity around this topic. For on my end, as a member of the 19, on the other end of those who are not members of the 19, uh, but what's done is done. Uh, when it comes to the purging of corruption, I am hoping that uh, some of my colleagues who are testifying are not are above the fray. But at this moment, all I can worry about is how I operate. One of the most interesting things about a legislature, any legislature, I suppose, is that there are generational issues that linger and that the state wrestles with and grapples with. There are moments where things improve. There are moments when things get worse. Corruption is one of those. But also in another er arena, Illinois has struggled for years uh, to compete nationally when it comes to this issue that almost everybody agrees on. Republicans and Democrats agree. There are people, there are tens of thousands of uh, adults and children with de de developmental disabilities in our state who are waiting on, in line to try and get services they need. This is like getting bathed in the morning, getting clothed, being fed. And many times parents are dealing with these situations or siblings or family of someone and they desperately need that help. The state has some services in position to help these people, but the funding level is so low that courts have said, we, the state of Illinois, are creating suffering for these people. Right. How many more years do they have to wait until that's fully funded? My fight is that they don't have to wait anymore. In this year, in this budget, you this think year, this you budget. could get, which that would mean multiplying by a factor of four, the extra funding Governor Pritzker proposed giving. If we're talking about equity, um, if we're talking about having an attitude of gratitude, because either me and you can become a member of the disability community just like that, depending on what happens to us, a freak accident, you just never know. We have to, uh, take the time out to look at this morally and not just economically or financially for our state. There are individuals who can't do the basic necessities that we take for granted because we can do it because we have the activities of our limbs. One thing that this, this pandemic has taught me at least is that since we came out of it, we cannot go back to the way of doing things before. That means the conversations and the debates we've had before should not be, have, should not, um, be debates anymore. There should be one of those. What if that threatens one of uh, Governor Pritzker's election year budget moves where he wants to give a freeze on the gas tax or he wants to give a, and maybe that's a bad example because that doesn't go into general revenue, that goes into other things. But what if, say the grocery tax, for example, he wants to give that relief to people feeling inflation. What if your pitch means, hey, in order to do this, we can't do that. Mm -hmm. Is that something you're willing to do? That's something I'm willing to do because I, I didn't, Honestly, I didn't even know what a gro grocery tax was until he mentioned it. A lot of states don't know what a grocery tax is because they don't have one. Right, that too. That too. Why, should, why are we taxing food in Illinois? Right. And how much are we getting from that tax uh, freeze? So uh, it's well and good. I understand what, he, what the governor's trying to do, and I respect that. Um, but we have to look at the, 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 the things that people are, have been going through, even 
before the pandemic. I know we're trying to bring relief, but even before the pandemic, when everything was uh, way better than it was before, as it is now, there are people who are still suffering. If we need that money to help them, then we need to go ahead and do it and tell the people why we're doing it. And like you said, it was a bipartisan support. People should understand. Each of the last five years, Illinois lawmakers have raised incrementally how much money goes into this program to provide those services. At the same time, those people who collect those paychecks who work in these difficult jobs have seen their cost of living go up dramatically in the last year or two. And that's where the fight comes down again is how much to pay these people that do these difficult jobs. Illinois has a tough time keeping people on the job there because many of them get that job. They realize how low the pay is, how hard the work is, and they don't stay long. They leave. Um, but there's an added component this year in this debate. It's not just do we just put more money and if so, how much? There's another part about how transparent should these companies be in opening up their books to show us are they pocketing those pay raises or are they giving them to the workers? Can you link those two ideas together? Can you make a deal with this industry that says, hey, we're going to pay you X, but we want to see how you spend it? Yes. Uh, Can I'll you make them contingent? That's the hope. I'm, I'm, I'm relying on uh, Representative Robinson and I forget who the other sponsor is of that other bill. I'm relying on them to do Senator the, Selena Villanueva, I think, in the go. Senate. Yep. Yeah, do their due diligence to make sure that this happens because you're absolutely right. They're, they come down here, advocate for, for mo more money, they get that money, and if they ask for a dollar, only 70 cents goes to the workers. They now, have, they will tell you stop. that they have to put some of that money aside to pay overtime or to pay employment taxes or to pay other things that go into the overall burden of having an employee on the books. Then show us what you're talking about. If you're asking to stay, some for of them more do. Money, they, some of them volunteer it, but not all of them. Right, not all of them. We should require for all of them to show us what they're talking about. Because if you're receiving state money, you should be uh, more than willing to be transparent with where the state fund is. Would you apply used. that same principle to other industries? If you're receiving state money, you should show us your books. Depends on what industries you're referring to, case by case. I don't know <laughs> what industries because I don't want to get caught up on saying yes and then. But there's a lot of industries getting state you're right. money. You're right, but yeah, uh, the the state needs the, the st that state and industry relationship needs to be transparent on both ends. Very interesting. Uh, as we go into this election year, one of the areas, one of the primary races that uh, has a lot of intrigue is in the Rockford area. Uh, the seat that Sherry Bustos has held in Congress for some time is now an open seat for Democrats. Who do you like? Well, you know what? I have three, um, three candidates coming out of Rockford and a couple out of Moline. And so the three can one of my predecessor um, is coming out of Rockford. And former Representative Latisa Wallace? Correct, correct. Uh, city Alderman, Jonathan, Jonathan Logan. Logan. Yep, and then another City Alderman, Linda McNeely, just filed on yesterday. Okay, so I did not know that. That's yeah. you're breaking a little bit of news on Capital Connection. <laughs> I guess it's already public. Yeah, so yeah, three coming out of Rockford. So um, you're making no enemies in this primary race. Is that what I hear? My top priority, honestly, is for the congressional member to come out of Rockford. And with three of them running, um, my hopes are... Why aren't donors excited about the Democrats in this race? That's a good question that I'm still trying to figure out myself. As state central committeeman, I'm trying to figure that out as well. Um, there were some ind other individuals who were thinking about getting into the race, and they were all saying, we're going to wait to see. Senator Steve Stottleman among them? Yeah, see, um, mainly him, um, who decided at the very last minute not to do it, and it threw things off, in my opinion. So donors were waiting for him to get in, he didn't, and now they're trying to survey the field and see who can actually win this thing. Because Esther Joy King is bringing in a bunch of money. Already over a million dollars. She's the Republican. Yep. She has experience. She's battle-tested. She lost against Sherry Bustos, but she came a little too close for comfort. There you go. Uh, for Sherry Bustos. Yep. Uh, looks like she's got the, she, she's now the closest thing to an incumbent this district has. The mm. district knows her. Does right. she have the upper hand here? Well, with... That would be a good question for after the petition cycle, after we go through the objection phase and who gets, who has the uh, adequate number because I need to know who's officially on the ballot. There's a lot of, a lot of the national political pundits look at how Illinois carved up the maps. And this might be a surprise for some people to hear, but they say Democrats left a lot of votes and Democratic votes on the table. They could have actually used gerrymandering hardball even harder to pack more Democrats into a seat like the 17th to make that a safer Democratic seat. And if that seat flips red, it could change the control of Congress. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the control of co Congress relies a lot on the 17th Congressional District. What, so. does that, what does that tell a Democrat running? You're a member of the State Central Committee. You want to see a Democrat win that seat. What does that tell them about how close this race would be? Or how does it shift their message? Can, will they have to reach across and grab Republican votes? And if so, how do they do that? We have to make sure that they have a message. What is it going to be? 
That's what's the message? That's what we're working on now. There's uh, inflation. There's rising crime. There's, right. I mean, you, you've seen the Republican campaign ads, and you've seen the facts on the ground. Mm -hmm. How does telling, a Democrat win right now? Telling their district what Democrats have done. Yes, there's rising crime in Illinois, but there's rising crime in every state around us as well. It's rising crime around the nation for some odd reason. Um, but what is the some message? Some odd reason. For some, for some reason. that Do you know the reason? Um, you, I don't know, honestly. To why it's, it's elevated so much, I, don't, I have no idea. I'm not going to speak on that. The pandemic created a lot of pressures. Right. I think it took away from people their sense of security and guarantee that they had a corner of this world that was theirs, whether it was a job or a school or a place mm -hmm. to be. Do you see? But it seems like as soon as we opened up, start opening up again, that's when crime uh, started rising even the more. So it was like, are you? What people are happy that they're out of their homes now? I don't know. So. Um, so you don't think it's necessarily just that easy to say that when people lost control, that they started asserting it in other violent ways? No, that's a valid point. Um, I just not looking at the studies, not looking at what you know experts are saying. I, I dare not speak on that. Um, uh, with confidence because I, I want to make sure that, that I, what I say is true. What do you see on the horizon in, in terms of solutions to br curb down that spike in violence? How do we stop the bleeding first and make, it, make this state a safer place? Uh, it has to be a mixture of everything that you hear in the, under this dome. You hear certain individuals saying we have to be tough on crime. You see, you hear other individuals saying we have to invest in our community. I'm on the side of uh, invest, definitely invest in our community and giving more power to the judges, as you spoke earlier, um, give, uh, let, allowing them to do risk assessments, uh, keeping people in jail who need to stay until their arraignment, until their court date, and, letting, uh, and, and ending cash bail and allowing others um, who have less uh, nonviolent petty offenses to uh, wait for their arraignment. Three of the four police widows who came to this building this week to deliver a letter to the governor and to have an audience with Senate President Harmon their husbands were killed by repeat offenders. In some cases, multiple offenses. Maybe some of them would be qualified as petty offenses, some of them more dangerous, more violent. Their message to our elected officials was, at some point, when a person shows you who they are, you gotta believe them. How can the law, because the law is ill-equipped to predict future behavior, but it can look in the past and say, you got, you got 11 strikes against you, man. I mean. Right. At what point can the law say, we can't keep allowing this? Or is that, how many attempts at grace does one person get? I, I wholeheartedly agree with you on that. And I'm sorry for the losses of those widows. Um, my heart goes out to them. We need to, as Democrats, we need to put ourselves in a position of share, showing people that this, the Safety Act, criminal justice reform we're, we're talking about, is not, is the foundation is not anti-cop. The foundation is not being uh, easy on crime. I tell my community uh, during the whole process of the Safety Act, it's about empowering the community, every single facet of our community, um, to, to be empowered uh, by their government, to be empowered by the law enforcement. We need to take a hard look, and I don't, I don't know, you know, since we're recording, I don't know uh, the specifics of each uh, fallen officer in that, in, that, in that story, in that conversation, but we need to take a hard look at that and see what needs to be done. P you hear people t blaming the judges, you hear the judges blaming uh, the, the, us as legislators. We need, I'm, I'm confident that the Public Safety Working Group will bring back a report that we can be confident in. I, I think that one of the aims of, when I was listening to the debate over the, the Safety Act, the Criminal Justice and Police Reform Bill, I think one of the aims was that the justice system should prevent victims, should, should, should not create new ones. And that was part of it. But do, do you, how do you look back now at some of the ways that the Safety Act constrains the behavior of police officers in the pursuit of suspects right there in that flash second moment of judgment? Should a police officer be stopping to think, wait a minute, what does that new law say again? What's the footnote? What's the fine print? Is, is that putting them in a position to succeed? Um, when you say it like that, no, it does not. We don't need our, a law enforcement officers. How would officers. you say it? Um, that's why I'm, my focus when it comes to uh, that scenario is to ensure that there's training dollars for our law enforcement officers, so that they are educated on what to expect, um, that they are confident when they're out in the street, that um, their motives won't get them thrown in jail. Um, this is not about catching 
uh, all of our law enforcement officers. This is about weeding out bad actors. There's bad actors under this dome, and that um, makes me look bad. Um, and I try my hardest to be ethical. Um, the same for our law enforcement officers. We're just putting safeguards in place um, to weed out the bad actors. It sounds like, in a way, you're saying you can almost, as, a pol as an Illinois politician, uh, that, that's a loaded connotation, right? <laughs> you can almost empathize with an industry of people or a subset of people who are painted often with a broad brush, yes. who are s stereotyped. Yeah, because it happens to me all the time. I yeah. can empathize with them. And so uh, what I would like is this public safety working group. I don't know if there's one in the Senate. I'm only focused on the House. That this public work safety working group uh, comes together and I'm, I'm thankful for the fact that the Safety Act makes the foundation of our conversations a little bit higher than it was before and see what, what we can uh, fix, see what we need to pivot on. Um, and that's, that's how things work down here in Springfield. Amend and, and tweak all the time. Let's do it. Uh, amend and tweak. So you're saying that you're open to some changes in that law? Even Depends on what those changes are. One of them could be uh, one, your colleague Patrick Windhorst, a prosecutor from uh, the southern part of Illinois, a Republican, has suggested that uh, the list of forcible felonies that would keep subje uh, suspects detained behind bars needs to expand a little bit. Because right now, uh, under the Safety Act, when it kicks in in 2023, in January, it would allow anybody out of jail immediately without paying bail or anything if they were accused of intimidating a witness. Say there was some other person they were associated with in some violent crime, and this other person, their associate, is now threatening the witness who might put them behind bars. The, you know how these things are. They're mm -hmm. very dynamic. And should that witness intimidation qualify as something that keeps you behind bars pre-trial? I, I respect Patrick Winhorst greatly, um, especially with his experience as a state's attorney down, down in Southern Massac Illinois. County, I think. Yeah. Um, that's something that I would, I'm open to looking into. However, I'm just one of many right. who is working on this legislation. Um, I had a meeting just yesterday with the judges in my county, the state's attorney in my county. My county's red, so of course the conversation wasn't uh, favorably <laughs> in my going the way I wanted it to. But at the same time, I'm listening to them to, because they are the subject matter experts in this field. Let's weigh the options, weigh what you're saying compared to what we're trying to do and see if it needs to be tweaked. And yes, if, there's, uh, if it's valid, then we'll do it. I'm hoping that we'll do it. Very interesting. House Democrat Maurice West, thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. We're back in just a moment.